This is what Jesus said. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Say that with me. You will recognize them by their fruits. He goes on to say, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree, shout a healthy tree. Every healthy tree, it bears what? Good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Notice, just because it was diseased doesn't note that it was absent of fruit, but its fruit was contrary to healthy fruit. It was bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Let us pray. Father, I pray that over the next few minutes, that as I minister the word as you've ministered it to me, Father, I pray that as I reach my hands out to touch your people, that whenever I pull my hands back, that they will have the fingerprints of God upon their life. Not because I preach to them, but because you did a work in them that only you could do by your spirit. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. May the Lord add his blessing in the reading to the hearing of his word today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Last Sunday, we began a new series entitled Fruitful. Shout Fruitful. We began a new series entitled Fruitful, and I am ministering throughout this month on the need, the utmost necessity of the fruit of the Spirit being in the life of the believer just as much as the power of God to be in the life of the believer. But before I get into my points this morning, I want to take just a few minutes to teach on something that I believe is very paramount for there to be context to what I will be ministering on today. I believe as a Pentecostal minister that the nine gifts of the Spirit are still made manifest today and that the gifts have not passed away. I believe that, that the power of God is just as needed today in the faith and in the life of the church as it was in Acts chapter 2. Friends, if it took the power of the Holy Spirit to birth the church, it's going to require the power of the Spirit to sustain the church until the Lord Jesus returns for his church. Friends, if the Holy Spirit was necessary unto being brought unto Christ, the Bible says that no man comes unto the Father unless the what? The Holy Holy Spirit draw him. So friends, even the salvific work of the grace of God in your life is a byproduct of the power of the Holy Spirit bringing you into right alignment with the Father. But I fear, I fear that oftentimes we, we get out of balance because we have this thought process that the gifts of God are more powerful than the fruit of the Spirit, that the gifts of the Spirit are more powerful than the fruit of the Spirit. This is the reason why Pentecostals put a, a tremendous amount of focus on speaking in tongues and laying on of hands and all of these different manifestations of gifts. But notice now, notice we can become so power focused that we become characterless. We become so focused on the gifts of the Spirit at the forfeiture of the fruit of the Spirit because we are less concerned with our character. We are more concerned with, with His power. The problem is, is that whenever your character doesn't line up with His power, then you are now falling into the same sin of Lucifer. You want His power, you want His authority, Notice now, you, you, you want his gifts, but you don't want his character. You don't want his correction. Come on, somebody. You don't want him getting involved in your life. You don't want the Holy Spirit telling you that you need to fix your attitude. Come on. I talked about this last Sunday that, friends, the anointing is always truthful, but, friends, the anointing is never rude. And one of the greatest forms of hypocrisy among the evangelical church is that we think that speaking in tongues and prophesying makes up for our lack of character. We want people to submit to us because of a gift, but you have no fruit of Jesus in your life. 
You may be able to speak in tongues and prophesy and discern spirits, but you're a gossip and you're a backbiter and you're a liar and you're a manipulator and you're an underminer and you've got a rebellious spirit and you don't know. Come on. Come on. I'm all for the power of God. I'm all for the gifts of the Spirit. I believe that that is an absolute necessity for the church in demonstrating the dunamis power of God. But we cannot develop the mentality, come on now, that the gifts are more supernatural than the fruit. Friends, for some of you that, I'll, I'll, okay, I'm just going to make something up. Some of y'all going, you, you know, well, you're going to plow, plow my row. I am. I'm coming for every one of y'all today. <laughs> Take a person who has a type A personality that has an extreme detail orientation. I'm talking about myself, right? There are dynamics to our personality that can be grating. We can be overly dominant. We can be overtly blunt. We cannot watch our tone. I get, I get in more trouble with Miss Ashley over not my decisions. It's, you need to check your tone. You need to, you know, I'm sorry, say that one more time just nicer. Come on, somebody. Right? So, now wait a second. I can get frustrated with that. I can get mad at that. Or I can let the Holy Spirit begin to manifest the fruit of Jesus in my life. Because friends, at some point, if you've got the Holy Ghost in you, I don't care what your personality type is. The anointing is never rude and it's never hateful. Come on. Far too often, we try to excuse away the fruit of our life and blame it on our personality. We we, want to dishonor or disown rather the fruit of our life and blame it on how we were raised. Come on. Come on. We want to Shove that away and use this as an excuse. But friends, if you've got the Holy Ghost in your life, you no longer have an excuse to forfeit the character of Christ because you're either going to die to yourself and choose to, to live for Him and let the Holy Spirit move and, move and have His very being in you, or you can continue to use excuses and try to operate in a gift that, that you have forfeited your, your right to manifest. This is the reason why Paul is talking about those who have, that are false prophets, who come in sheep's clothing, they look good, they have the, come on, they have the title and they have the, the, the position and they have the this and they have the that, but inwardly, see, you're seeing the outward manifestation of a prophet, but, but you're not seeing the inward issues of being a ravenous wolf. Notice Jesus does not negate the fact that there's a prophetic gift. What what he's challenging is, is that you better look past the outward manifestation of the gift because if there's no fruit on the inside of them, they have no right to walk in that gift. Friends, whenever we say that we want to manifest the gifts of the Spirit, but forfeit our responsibility to apologize to other people whenever we didn't act right. Come on. We are great at speaking in tongues. We are terrible at saying, I'm sorry. Come on. We are great at throwing our hands up and getting our shout and doing a, we're great at doing, we are terrible at saying, you know what? My spirit wasn't right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have responded that way. I'm sorry. You know, my attitude in that situation wasn't right. I'm sorry. For some of us, it's just as supernatural for you to take ownership of your bad decisions and say, I'm sorry. As much as it is for somebody else to be supernaturally empowered to pray in the Spirit. Who I just, I said a whole bunch. I, I just get an altar call and everybody needs to just come to the altar and repent today. Right? Friends, the manifestation of the character of Christ in us by the power of the Holy Spirit is just as supernatural as the gifts of the Spirit being made manifest in us. Because notice now, Jesus talking about the false prophet. The gifts are external. The fruit are internal. 
the gifts manifest where other people can hear and see. But the fruit is typically birthed on the inside of you to where nobody can see until something happens and then that fruit is released. Right? So we have to move past. I'm challenging us to mature as spirit-filled evangelical people to move past being so enamored with the gifts of the Spirit at the forfeiture of the fruit of the Spirit because you have no right to operate in a gift whenever your character is not in line with the God that is trying to manifest the gift. Friends, our life, balance, shout balance. Our gifts and our fruits have to be balanced on the same scale. But whenever there is such a pressure on the gift and there's no fruit, then where's your conversion? I only had about three amens. Now again, friends, I'm all for speaking in tongues. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I pray in tongues more than ye all. I thank God for the manifestations of the gifts. But, but what I am tired of is tongue-talking people who are hateful. What I am tired of is tongue-talking people that say that they speak in tongues, but, but by the same power forfeit the right to control the very tongue that they're trying to speak in tongues with. What I am tired of are tongue-talking people saying that they've got the joy of the Lord and you're hateful to everybody, in, including your spouse. I'm tired of people saying that they have the gifts of the Spirit, but there's no fruit to your conversion. There's no character of Christ. The people that you work with, Would they be willing to receive the gifts of the Spirit from your life by virtue of what they observe in conduct with working with you on a daily basis? Who, Jesus? That's what I'm talking about. It's the balancing of walking and manifesting the character of Christ because, friends, that is just as supernatural. I'll give you an example. I'm going to take it a step further. For those of us who come out of substance abuse, friends, the goal is not sobriety. I'm going to go to this side of the room. The goal is not just being sober. Because you can be sober and still be an addict. You can be sober and still struggle. You can be sober and you can't walk to certain parts of, of Sam's Club because if you get close to the alcohol aisle, you, your mouth starts to salivate and you start to shake and tremble. Friends, sobriety is not freedom. It's just sobriety. Rehabilitation is for the soul. It is not just for the actions of the life. Friends, there's a freedom in Jesus. There's a freedom in Jesus. And the goal is not just sobriety. The goal is freedom in Christ. What? Whenever self-control, when the fruit of self-control begins to manifest in you, and then all of a sudden, I'm not just sober, I'm free. Whenever peace begins to manifest in you, and it's, I'm not just struggling with anxiety, I'm free. Whenever, whenever people, whenever situations start happening and people are blowing their top and all of a sudden your typical re response protocol was nuclear, right? But then guess what? Whenever the Holy Spirit starts working on the inside of you and situations like that happen, all of a sudden people are looking, you can go, wait a second, you didn't blow up like you used to. You didn't cuss them out. Come on, somebody. You didn't talk to them the way that you used to. There's just something different about what's going on with you. And then you can start talking about how the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of you and is transforming your, your very being. Friends, the goal of being fruitful is powerful. But if we hosted a prophecy conference here, I'd have to pull out chairs. But in most churches, if you hosted a fruit investigation series <laughs> or a character development, whoo, I'm about to say something. Far too many of you are converts and you're not disciples. 
You converted because the message, you liked it. I ain't got to go to hell. Praise God. Conversion is looking at Jesus as fire insurance. But a disciple says, I'm converted and I'm going to be disciplined in the teachings of Christ by the help of the Holy Spirit. And now, now you're not just a convert. You're not just somebody that says, oh, hey, I'm a Christian, right? Far too, in, far too many Christians are Christian culturally only. There are no Christian disciplines to their life. There's no fundamental discipleship of getting into the Word and letting the Word of God bring correction to us. This is why preaching like what I'm giving today is called old holiness preaching. Because I could get up here and talk about how if you give a $1,000 seed today, I'm just going to tell you, if you drop a $1,000 seed in the offering, and the Lord's going to move, and he's going to drop a bitly in your driveway, and Kool-Aid's going to come out of your water fountain. All you got oh, to do is trust the Lord. Foolishness. Why would Jesus take charge of a debt that you made? You're the one who bought the, the $65,000 bass boat on bad credit at 12% interest. That ain't Jesus' problem. You did that. Fruit. Power. If I lived in abject sin every day of the week, I would forfeit my right to stand in the pulpit. I would forfeit my right for any of you to, to receive from me. Now, does that mean that I'm perfect? No. Am I going to make mistakes? Yes. I am not a perfect pastor and I'll never claim to be. But I'm doing my best to stay as close as I can to the line in serving Jesus and leading my home and pastoring the church. <laughs> Friends, if that's applicable, oh, see all of y'all clapping, but you ain't going to clap in just a second. If all of that is applicable to me in the pulpit, If that's applicable to me, to the pulpit, then how much more so is that going to be applicable to your life when you have to answer to Jesus, not just for how you use your gift, but how you manifested his character. So now that I've given all of you sermon number one, I'm going to preach the second sermon for today. I'm closing, I promise. Everybody's like, no, you're not. No, I'm not. I just, I, I, I own that. That wasn't a lie. I quickly owned it. Okay? So here's, so just a couple of thoughts that I want to leave you with. Point number one, friends, whenever our lives become fruitful in our faith, we understand that the fruit of the Spirit is the one thing that we cannot counterfeit. I'm going to say that again. Whenever our lives become fruitful in our faith, we understand that the fruit of the Spirit is the one thing that we can't counterfeit. I talked about this last week. We're going to go just a little bit deeper. I can fake tongues. I can't fake self-control. I can fake prophecy. I can't fake long-suffering. Come on. I can fake faith, but I can't fake temperance. Because, friends, life has a way of testing your fruit to see if you're where you need to be. And we can counterfeit gifts all we want to, but you can't fake the fruit. You can't manufacture it and you can't counterfeit it. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. Say that with me. I've got to have the Holy Ghost. I've got to have the Holy Ghost. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. Friends, whenever our lives, whenever we live our lives in and through the Holy Spirit, others will recognize that there is a fruit that is contrary to our humanity. Whenever the Spirit of God is moving in us, we will manifest fruits of His character that are contrary to our humanity. Church family, there's a big difference between leaves and fruit. Who I'm going somewhere. There's a big difference between leaves and fruit. There's a huge difference between a form of godliness and actually manifesting the genuineness of that godliness. I'm going to give you an example of this scripturally. Whenever Jesus is dealing with something in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 18, the Bible says, in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And whenever the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? Isn't it interesting 
how Jesus saw the leaves on the tree, but he was frustrated whenever there was no fruit on the tree. There, there was a lack of fruit that brought a curse. He was cut down and thrown into the fire. Church family, whenever the leaves of life, the forms of godliness of our lives draw people to us, but the fruit of our lives do, does not impact them, then we are just like the fig tree noted in the gospel of St. Matthew chapter 21. We have a sign of fruitfulness, but yet we have no fruit. Isn't it interesting that whenever Adam and Eve fell and they what? They lost the character and the manifestation of God in their lives. And the Bible says their eyes were open. What was the first thing that they did? They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And how often do we sow the fig leaves of religion? Forms of godliness and try to cover ourselves. Not realizing that you might have the leaves but there's no fruit. There's no character of God. Friends, the leaves are signs of fruitfulness, but without the fruit, the leaves are a deception. Whenever Adam and Eve fell, they what? They covered themselves, but they still hid themselves. Why? You would think covering themselves would have been enough. Why did they cover themselves and then hide? Because they realized that the leaves were not enough. And whenever you start serving God and the Holy Spirit starts dealing with you, you'll realize that religion, it's not enough. And you'll start covering yourself with fig leaves, forms of godliness, but, but in turn denying the very power thereof. Why? Because you have a sign of fruitfulness, but there's no substance to the fruitfulness. You have signs of looking good. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. I need an oxygen tank today. Brutal not, and not loving God, treacherous, reckless, swollen with, with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse number 5, having a form or an appearance of godliness but denying his power, avoid such people. Friends, you can have the leaves without the fruit, but you cannot have the fruits without the leaves. There must be the sign and the substance of our faith in Jesus and not just lip service. Now, what, why did Paul say this to avoid such people? Because avoiding those who have leaves but have no fruit. Avoid those who have a form of godliness but in turn deny the power thereof. Friends, there's a reason why Jesus cursed the fig tree and this is the very reason why that they must bear fruit. There's a reason why in the passage of text that I read last week whenever Jesus was talking about that we are, that, that we are the branches and he is divine. And if, and if we don't produce, we're what? We are cut away and cast into outer darkness where there's flames and gnashing of teeth. Friends, there, there's a reason why he expects us to be fruitful and not just leafy. There needs to be a fruit. There needs to be a fruit. Elbow your neighbor and tell them there needs to be a fruit. We're, we're, we are called to be fruitful and not leafy. I'm all for being full of the Holy Spirit. What I'm not for is fruits, flakes, and nuts. <laughs> Friends, he expects more from us than just leaves. Church family, he expects more from us than just leaves. He expects more from us than just church attendance. He expects more from us than just going through the motion so that our conscience doesn't bother us. No, no, no. Friends, the gathering on Sundays is the celebration of what God has done all week. The end gathering of the body is the body coming together to minister to the body because the Holy Spirit is moving and living and breathing and having his very being through each and every one of our lives and how God, and when God rather, whenever he begins to, to transform us, notice now he transforms us from the inside out, not the outside in. Jesus' problem was not that there was a lack of leaf. His issue is that there was a lack of fruit. Jesus' problem is not with there being godliness or a manifestation of it. His issue is whenever there's only a form of it, but no substance to it. 
This is the reason why you cannot come to church and speak in tongues and shout and engage in a message and then go to lunch on Sundays to a local restaurant and be ugly to your waiter and say that you love Jesus. Did you know that most people who work in the food industry despise working on Sundays because they don't want to deal with church folk? How many of us are leafy? We've got all of the visible signs of being fruitful. One thing that I've learned with having pecan trees on my property is that pecans, I can only see when I'm close. Fruit. Leaves, I can always see at a distance. But I can't tell how fruitful the tree is until I get up close to it. And whenever you start getting close to people, and people start getting close to you, is the substance to your life only a leaf? Or are there some fruit on the branches? Whenever people see your life, do they just see your church bumper sticker and the assembly sticker on your car? Or do whenever they engage with you, do they see a manifestation of the character of Christ in your life to where they can look at you and go, they're a follower of Jesus. I shared this last week, and I'm going to make mention of it again. Many of us remember this old commercial about the fast food chain. Where's the? And how many people in our community in Washita Parish and in the state and in this nation are looking at churches around this country going, where is the fruit? Y'all have got leaves. You've got air-conditioned sanctuaries and comfortable chairs and everything is looked, but where's the fruit? We want to talk about the power of God manifesting gifts. What about the power of God manifesting His character through you? And bringing your life in order to whenever people engage with you, they don't hear and see gifts. They receive and partake of fruit. Friends, the gifts of the Spirit is the power of Christ being made manifest through you by the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is the power of Christ in His character being made manifest through you. Friends, it's not... Your gifts make room for you. People have quoted this scripture from Proverbs. I'm getting ready to close. I'm not even going to make it through all my points today. People talk about the Bible in the book of Proverbs whenever it says that a man's gifts will, will make room for him, right? It'll make, it'll make room for him. May I submit to you a thought. This is not me adding to Scripture. This is just a thought. Your gifts may give you access to the room, but it is your character that will keep you in the room. Because I have met people who had tremendous gifting. I've met people in the secular world and also in the ministry world have unbelievable gifting, phenomenal gifting, great gifting, super intelligent, like gifted. But their character, their character forfeits the room for their gifting. Because there comes a point, it doesn't matter how gifted someone is, if their character is garbage, you don't want to be around them. It doesn't matter how gifted they are. And if that's true relationally, how much more so is that true spiritually? Well, Pastor, this is an odd message to preach on Mother's Day. I know. But there comes a point, friends, there comes a point where we've got to start letting the Holy Spirit bring order to our lives and stop thinking that our gifts outweigh our lack of character. So I'll just operate in my gifts. When I played high school football, I had desires to play college football. I was the first one in the gym. I was the last one out of the gym. I got the coaches award three years in a row. I, I, was, I ate, slept, and breathed football. But here's what I learned in athletics. 
power lifted and then I, I played football in spring, fall, spring, fall. That was, that was my deal for four years. I graduated high school, I went to college and I decided to not do football because I could not play football and serve Jesus. I came to that realization. Here's my point. What I learned from my strength coach was this. Your gifts, your strengths will always tend to themselves. It is your weaknesses that need attention. It's your weaknesses that need attention. But for an athlete who has never been trained properly, he puts so much focus on his strength, thinking that his strength will outpace his weakness. And the problem is, it's his weakness that keeps his gift or his strength from moving from good to great. And if we're not careful, as followers of Jesus, friends, we will focus so much on the gifts and the power at the forfeiture of the weaknesses in our lives concerning the character of Christ, and we therefore now forfeit our gifts from ever being received. This is the reason why leaders have moral failures and fall. It's because they put such a focus on their gifts and their strengths and they think that the gift and the strength will outpace the weakness. And they're afraid to address the weakness, but eventually the weakness catches up. This is why I shared earlier that sobriety is not freedom. It's just that you're sober. That's a weakness that needs the power of the Holy Spirit to bring self-control into so that we can be strengthened in our inner man and then in turn manifest the character of Jesus. At what point are we going to embrace the Holy Spirit's correction in our lives concerning our character? and mature in Jesus. For some reason, there's this teaching now that is sweeping the modern evangelical church stating that the Holy Spirit no longer convicts us of sin because Jesus took all of that out of the way. Friends, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. If he can't counsel me and bring correction to me, then am I God or is he? There are times where I need the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get all country with it. I need the Holy Spirit to get in my grits and gravy and tell me that I'm wrong and that I need to repent of that and turn and change. I need the Holy Spirit to bring correction to my character. Why? Because I'm smart enough to know. I'm smart enough to know. That it does not matter how gifted any of us are. That if our fruit, if the character of Jesus is not known in our life, it doesn't matter how gifted any of us are. Our gifts will never be received because our fruit forces others to forfeit any right of influence of the gift. I know that's not popular preaching. And I get it. But at some point, if we're going to grow in Christ, if we're going to mature as disciples and not just converts, if we're going to be truly the sons and daughters of God, then we've got to let the Holy Spirit have rule and reign in our hearts and our lives. And that includes in our character as much as it is in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Paul said it this way. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have not the fruit or the character of Christ in me. I'm nothing. What was Paul trying to say? It doesn't matter how many gifts that you manifest. If your life does does not align with the character of Christ, then the power of Christ will never be received from somebody else from you. If I can have Pastor Brad to come to the piano this morning. Friends, I'm smart enough to know that life is difficult and life is hard. I counsel families weekly. 
But how many issues in our life manifest not just because of bad decisions, but because of a lack of character development in the character of Christ in our personal lives? How many conflicts have manifested in our marriages? Because there was an absence of fruit. How many things have gone wrong that we have to own because we didn't do it God's way, we were bound and determined to do it our way? How many things are you facing right now? How many things are you facing right now that is a byproduct of not letting the Holy Spirit develop you in your inner man to bring order to your life. I'm gonna tell you, this sermon series has hammered me because there's things that the Holy Spirit starts to deal with me about in my marriage and in the raising of my children and in the, and in the manners of life and, and different things that the Holy Ghost is going, hey, you need to correct that. Hey, you need to bring. And I'm going, thank God. I thank God that the Holy Spirit is trying to what? He's seeking to fashion the image of Christ in my life. The Bible tells us in Romans that it is the goal of the Father for us to be transformed into the image of His dear Son. And every one of us, including me, we've got some transforming to do. We've got some transforming to do. We've got some image of Jesus that needs to be etched indelibly upon our hearts and, and on our minds. We've got some areas in our life that we keep proverbially slapping the hands of the Holy Spirit saying, don't, don't touch that. Just please, Jesus, just, just leave that alone. And we're trying to swat the hand of the Holy Spirit away from our life. Quit swatting. Quit telling God no. The fact that he's trying to correct it tells me, friends, God doesn't waste his time. The fact that he's attempting to fix it tells me that he can if you let him. The fact that the Holy Spirit is dealing with you in your inner man tells me that God's not done with you yet. I thank God that in my time of study and in preparation for the delivery of my sermons on Sunday, I, friends, I pray this. I pray this out loud oftentimes. Holy Spirit, convict me of what, I'm, of, of, of what you're giving to me. I don't want to preach and deliver a message that I'm unqualified to, de to deliver because my life doesn't add up to it. And friends, there are messages oftentimes that are just as convicting to me, just as heavy and just hammering and chiseling to my life as it is to you while I'm preaching it. Friends, if, if the Word of God is not correcting me, there, there's no... I'm wasting my time. I thank God that the Holy Spirit is still correcting me and working on me and moving in my life and trying to help me and allowing me to walk in freedom over things that decades ago had me in bondage. Friends, God is good and God is faithful. And if we would simply, people talk about, I know the joke that we're making. Jesus, take the wheel. We've all heard that at least once. Jesus, just take the wheel. Well, your problem was is that you got him out of the driver's seat to begin with. But let me just, uh, just let me take a step further here. Some of us need to move past the mentality of Jesus, just take the wheel, just just help me fix this so that I can get, get back to driving in my own direction. What we need to do today is pull the car over, get out of the car, walk to the rear of the vehicle, unlock the trunk, open the lid, step inside, give the keys to Jesus, sit down, close the lid, and then whisper through the keyhole, Lord Jesus,
drive me wherever you want to go. At this point, I don't care because every time I put my hands on the wheel of my life, I wreck it. Just drive and I'll be happy with wherever you take me. Talk, people talking about, well, Jesus is my co-pilot. Leave him in the cockpit and you need to go to the back of the plane and just sit down. Let him fly. Let him drive. Trust him. And church family, when the Holy Spirit starts to deal with you, when, when conviction over things start to well up in your inner man and the Holy Ghost is trying to bring order and transformation to your life, don't fight what God is trying to do. He's fashioning the image of Christ in your life. And I promise you, when you let the Holy Spirit do His job, your life will begin to transform in ways that you never thought possible. And here's the deal. Not only will you start seeing it, people around you will start making comment about it. You know, man, he ain't, he ain't like he used to be. He don't respond the way, he don't think the way, he don't act the way, he don't speak the way. Something's different about, I need to ask him what happened. I need to ask him what, what, what's different, man, what's different about you? You're smiling on this all the time. What happened to you? Well, let me just tell you about what happens when you let the Holy Spirit have priority in your life. Things start to change. And one day you'll look up and you'll go, I'm not who I used to be anymore. Amen. Can we put our hands together for the Lord and all that He's doing in and through our lives? Friends, we're not who we used to be. We're not who we used to be. Thank God. Thank God. Elbow your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, I'm not who I used to be. I'm not where I need to be yet, but I'm on the way. Amen.